My name is Dr. Yurif Haiken, and I'm a cardiac electrophysiologist. Today, I would like to talk to you about atrial fibrillation. Atrial fibrillation is a very common disorder of uh, the rhythm of your heart. As you know, normally, your heart is supposed to be in what we call the sinus rhythm. In your heart, there are four chambers, two on top and two at the bottom. Your rhythm starts in the right upper chamber in an area called the sinus node. Essentially, it works like a beacon. It produces so many impulses, electrical impulses per minute, which activate the upper chambers to pump blood into the bottom chambers through the valves. And then through specialized conduction system, the bottom chambers get activated to pump the blood to the lungs and around your body. Now, in the left upper chamber, you have veins that drain blood from the lungs into the heart, empty into this chamber where these veins, essentially pipes, connect to the back wall of the left upper chamber, the area is prone to generate a lot of extra beats or extra electrical impulses. These electrical impulses are sort of like somebody throwing a match towards a can of gasoline. They're prone to ignite an electrical storm of atrial fibrillation with short circuits and discharges going around to the upper chamber at very rapid rates as fast as 300, 400, and faster beats per minute. Unfortunately, with that, the upper chambers cannot pump anymore, and so blood doesn't circulate properly, and a blood clot can form in one of the cul-de-sacs in the left upper chamber called the left atrial appendage. The danger in forming a blood clot in your heart is in that the blood clot can go places and cause a heart attack or a stroke. And so the cornerstone of treatment for atrial fibrillation is anticoagulation or blood thinners. These are medications we would usually prescribe to you based on your risk to prevent you from having a stroke if you have atrial fibrillation. Typically, we give blood thinners to patients who are over 65 and or have one of the risk factors or more risk factors such as diabetes, high blood pressure, heart failure, or having had history of a blood clot in the past. The second problem with atrial fibrillation is that of very rapid conduction from upper chambers to lower chambers. When the lower chambers beat more rapidly, are in the ballpark of 120, 150, or 180 beats per minute for a long time while in atrial fibrillation, the bottom chambers may wear out, and in fact, atrial fibrillation can lead to congestive heart failure as a result in some patients. And finally, the third problem in these patients is the fact that they don't feel well, either because of very rapid or very erratic heart rate. This brings me to another topic, that of rate control. As a second line of therapy for atrial fibrillation, we want to make sure that the conduction system in your heart does not conduct more than about 100 impulses per minute while you are at rest. Obviously, your heart rate is supposed to go up when you exercise. We use medications like beta blockers or calcium channel blockers in order to control that, this conduction. Unfortunately, some patients may not be able to tolerate these medications and some may feel tired or unwell because of medications alone. The third line of therapy is that of rhythm control, which is typically achieved with medications such as antiarrhythmics. And these include flecainide, propafenone, sotolol, dronedarone, dofedolide, and amiodarone. Unfortunately, these second-line medications have even more side effects. Again, can make you feel tired, but more importantly, can lead to even more dangerous arrhythmias. And in the case of amiodarone, can make you prone to sunburn, affect your thyroid, affect your lungs, liver, eyes, and other organ systems. For a number of years now, We've also been offering our patients a procedure called an ablation, variably called pulmonary vein isolation, pulmonary vein antrum isolation, AF ablation, etc. What we aim to accomplish with this procedure is electrical isolation of the pulmonary veins. Remember, these are the tubes that drain blood from the lungs into the left upper chamber. To accomplish this, we put catheters, thin wires through the vein in your groin up to your heart we cross the septum, a thin wall, between the right upper and the left upper chambers of your heart. 
and we either cauterize or freeze the interface between the left upper chamber and these veins in order to eliminate the extra beads that normally cause atrial fibrillation. The procedure has come a long way. This day and age, it takes us anywhere from about an hour to two, two and a half hours to perform the procedure, depending on complexity and duration of atrial fibrillation. In most patients, we isolate the veins. Every so often, we may also go after various short circuits if we find them in either the left upper or the right upper chamber of the heart. We find that 70 to 75% of the time, we get away with one ablation. About 20 to 25% of the patients end up coming back for a second ablation at some point, typically three to six months later. And about 5% of the patients end up having to come back for a third ablation at some point down the road. Risk factors uh, associated with ablation include risk of bleeding or infection at the groin, placing catheters. There is no cutting or stitching involved. There is a small risk of bleeding around the heart, which in the extreme may need to be fixed surgically. Small risk of a heart attack, stroke, and risk to life we quote to all of our patients. Recently, a study comparing atrial fibrillation ablation to medical therapy, either rhythm or rate controlled, called Cabana, had been presented. While in the past, we've known for a while that patients who were ablated are much more likely to feel better over time than patients treated with medication, Cabana shed some light on the fact that these patients, at least in some instances, are more likely to survive longer and uh, to have fewer strokes, which again uh, is a great justification to go ahead with this procedure, particularly if you have symptoms related to atrial fibrillation or do not like taking medication. A special population is that of patients with congestive heart failure, and a number of studies, uh, particularly a number of studies published recently, confirm that patients with atrial fibrillation do substantially better with ablation compared to other forms of uh, treatment for atrial fibrillation. Now, to be complete, ablation is not for everyone. Some patients have very large atria, some have significant disease of their aortic or mitral valves and may need surgery, uh, where the surgeons would replace or repair a valve and perform a similar ablation procedure called maze or a maze procedure while they're uh, performing uh, surgery for the valve or bypass surgery. The surgeons may also offer to take off the left atrial appendage, the source of blood clot, which may give you a stroke, again, lowering your risk of um, stroke related to atrial fibrillation. There is a non-invasive procedure related to the appendage as well, where a special plug can be placed, again, using a similar approach to that we use with ablation, to place the plug in the left atrial appendage and again, lower your risk of stroke. We offer this procedure to patients who cannot take blood thinners, who cannot take medications that we would normally prescribe to lower the risk of stroke. And finally, those patients who really cannot undergo AF ablation because of advanced age, comorbidities, uh, other illnesses, um, and risk associated with the procedure may be candidates for what we call pace and the blade approach, where a pacemaker is placed in order to make sure to provide some backup rhythm in the lower chambers of the heart or the ventricles. And we place just a single catheter to ablate or cauterize the AV node, the normal conduction system between the upper and lower chambers, thus preventing atrial fibrillation from conducting rapidly and causing congestive heart failure in this group of patients. Thank you.